Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. We're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. If you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. We're excited to partner with the Mississippi Museum of Art to bring Isabel Wilkerson, author of Cast and the Warmth of Other Suns, to Jackson for our Medgar Wiley Evers Lecture Series. That program will take place at 6.30 p.m. tomorrow, September 8th, in Galloway Church Sanctuary. It's free, but you will need to register online to reserve your seats. You can find that link um, to do that on the websites of the department and the art museum. And don't forget that their fantastic Movement in Every Direction exhibit closes this Sunday, uh, the 11th. It is free on Sundays, though. And also happening this Sunday, September 11th at 2 p.m., we'll be having a free screening of the film The Green Book Guide to Freedom. That Smithsonian Channel documentary details the history of the Green Book and works in partnership with the traveling exhibit on display upstairs here through September 25th. Finally, I hope that you'll join us next week for History's Lunch when our old friend Douglas Richardson, who gave a fantastic presentation on his original research of the Clinton Massacre for History's Lunch several years ago, will present Yellow Man Vincent and the 1835 Slave Insurrection Scare. Today, we are delighted to welcome Jennifer McGillan from the Mississippi State University Libraries to present Digitizing Legal Records of Enslaved Persons, The Lantern Project. Jennifer McGillan became coordinator of manuscripts at Mississippi State University in 2015. She holds a BA in English from Davidson College, an MLIS archives from the University of Pittsburgh, and a JD from New York Law School. McGillan is founding member and president of the Southeastern Archives Association, member and past president of the Society of Mississippi Archivists, and has served on the board of directors of the Mississippi Historical Society. Help me welcome Jennifer McGillan. There we go. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Y'all can hear me? Okay, good. Um, thank you all so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I also, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that this subject matter and these records are very hard. Uh, and I know you all knew what you were signed up for when you came in here today, but if I get into it and you're like, you know what, actually no, uh, and you can't, and it's like you just, I cannot do this today, tap out if you have to. I will not be upset. All right. Um, so this is the Lantern Project, and this is our website at the top here. Uh, the participating institutions are Mississippi State University, University of Mississippi, Delta State, the Columbus Lounge Public Library in Columbus, Mississippi, Historic Natchez Foundation in Natchez, and the Montgomery County Archives in Montgomery, Alabama. The purpose of this project is to digitize and transcribe legal records of enslaved persons from Mississippi and Alabama from roughly 1800 to 1865. I didn't realize how far back they went uh, until, we got, until we really got into the probate records of Natchez. And I'm like, oh wait, these are from 1802. And there were things that were from territory time. And I'm like, hold on, this is a lot older than I, I don't know why, but they were older than I was expecting. So this project has been funded by a grant from the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, or the NHPRC of the United States National Archives and Records Administration. I do also want to take a moment here and acknowledge our own, very st our own state archives uh, and thank them for all of their support and encouragement uh, during this project, and particularly during the application process. Really appreciate that, y'all. All right, so, uh, so why did we do this? Um, it was inspired by a similar project called Unknown No Longer at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. It's now hosted by the Library of Virginia. And it's a response to a specific ongoing need shared by all of the participants. It's a responding to inquiries from patrons regarding records of enslaved persons. Uh, it's a common desire also among the partner institutions to address historic inequalities 
and shared access problems from un ranging from under-processed collections to scribbly 19th century handwriting. There's a lot of barriers to getting to these records. Um, it's also an acknowledgement of uh, historical context and some geographical realities, which is that when enslaved persons were sold down the river, it was our river. It was the Mississippi or other local waterways. Um, you see a lot of references in contemporary accounts of family separation where they talk about how family members vanished into darkness. And we called it the Lantern Project because this is our attempt to turn on the lights. Um, so planning. So first thing was we created a proof of concept or a, or a test bed, a test case, using documents from the manuscripts collections at Mississippi State, which I then shared via email with potential collaborators to give people an idea of the, uh, the kind of work and the amount of work that would be required uh, and to sort of get an idea of who would be interested. And there were a lot of people who were interested who were not able to participate in this grant. So we had, we had a really tremendous and encouraging amount of response. So the partners that ended up participating that we had, or that we had approached um, for a variety of reasons, either they had existing similar projects uh, that, I, that I already knew about, they had relevant collections, and also for geographic coverage of the state. Um, the data gathering technology requirements, so we're using Excel <laughs> spreadsheets, or, or in some case, cases, Google Docs, were deliberately minimal uh, to encourage participation from organizations with differing budgets, staffing levels, and technological capabilities. Uh, one thing we do recognize, there's, you can see there's a lot of different institutions happening here. Uh, not everybody has the same kind of access to technology or the same kind of staffing levels that a big university does. So, the subject of the big university, Mississippi State took point, uh, taking advantage of existing administrative infrastructure and connections to manage a project of this size. Uh, very specifically to use the power of the big university to, to raise all the boats. We, we, uh, you know, we have an entire department whose job it is to help me with grants. Uh, shout, shout out to Office of Sponsored Programs for that. Um, so we said, all right, we'll take care of the making the budgets and writing the reports and, and managing all of this, and all y'all have to do is work on and all, it's a, still a huge project, uh, is the data gathering and everything else. So, um, so, when, so when we were looking at collaborators, we were leveraging existing connections with, within the archival communities in Mississippi and Alabama. It's a big state, but not a big archival community. We know each other, right? We know, we know each other's collections, we know each other's projects. We go to conferences and we talk to each other. Our collections also talk to one another. They have common themes. Uh, also, sometimes we have common collections. Uh, sometimes family collections can be spread across the entire state, uh, the Isaac Ross, Papers, for example, uh, Mississippi State has a little bit, the University of Mississippi has some, and MDH has some. So if you wanted to see all of that collection, that's at least six hours of driving. That's before you even get into the, to the reading room to look at the papers. Okay. Um, so the other thing that I did was contacted organizations that had uh, successfully received a grant from this from the from the NHPRC to talk about the idea and to get some tips and everything and and that uh, also yielded uh, some great advice and some collaborative other collaborative opportunities. So uh, I also want to say we're not done. <laughs> so if you if you go to the website and you're like this isn't very much, it's not done yet. There's more coming. Um, but we have scanned hundreds of pages of documents, including bills of sale probate records, court records, deeds, receipts, and more. And they are in the process of being transcribed and added to the project collection in the Mississippi State Digital Collections. So now let's talk about what are these things. So let's start with the probate files. Some of you, unfortunately, may have some experience with probate court, um, but I know not everybody does. Uh, so what is a probate file? A probate file contains records documenting the management and disposition of the estate or property of a deceased person. So documents in probate files uh, that, that we are looking at specifically for this 
include estate inventories and appraisals, records of the financial administration of the estate, receipts and bills of sale of, of enslaved persons, documents relating to medical treatment for enslaved persons, and other records documenting the activities of the executor of the estate. So estate inventories and appraisals were created by court order, and these include all the real and personal property, land, structures, enslaved persons, livestock, furniture, and other personal property belonging to the deceased person. And some of these probate files also include original will, which, also, which, doesn't, which frequently includes a wealth of family information, as well as the disposition of the property. So, um, so inventories and appraisals. The estate inventory is a document that lists the deceased person's property, including enslaved persons, usually with an assigned value, or, or, or that's what we call the appraisal. And then in some instances, there is a will which will indicate which specific property, and this can encompass enslaved persons, was to be transferred to members of the deceased person family. But other times, the will just says, you know, my son is to have one third of my estate, or my, my wife, my daughter is to have, you know, one third of my property, uh, or, it's, or it's set on dollar values or, or percentage or something like that. So uh, since I mentioned it on the radio this morning, this is one kind of document uh, that we are working on transcribing and, uh, and describing. And this, is that gonna work? Maybe, no? Anyway, that over there <laughs> uh, is, um, that's a, it's a drawing of a plot of land, right? Now, can I, you know, if I'm, if I'm transcribing this so a screen reader can read it to somebody, if I basically redraw it on the screen, that doesn't help. You know, you're just going to have the screen reader just sort of reading dash, 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 you know, exclamation point. So, uh, so I had to sort of switch gears and, uh, and really think about describing the image that I was looking at on the screen and not just faithfully transcribing the text. Uh, and, in, and in this is an instance where they are dividing the land among the, uh, the five heirs. And we had included this. This does not specifically mention the enslaved person, but we did include this because we were trying to include things that might be relevant to the location of a plantation uh, or where the enslaved persons might have been living. And then this is the second page. Uh, and as you can see over there, they have this lovely little drawing of the, the spring houses and the, and the spring that goes through it. Uh, they also have whose land on, is on either side of that. And then down here, they have uh, the record of the chain carriers for the surveyors, which is sort of an interesting little historical detail. And the other thing that I noticed as I was transcribing this is that one of the chain carriers is one of the heirs. <laughs> I'm like, is that, that might be a weensy bit of a conflict of interest, but anyway. Um, okay, so uh, auctions and appraisals, in some instances, such as when there was no will, once the property had been appraised or valued, a public auction was held. There will then be a list of the property sold, including the auction price and uh, Purchaser, and the auction price can be and often is different from the appraisal value. So if you're looking at a, if you're looking at a list and you're like, the, the names are the same, but the, the numbers are different. Uh, one may be the appraisal and one may be the auction. So this is an example of an appraisal. This is from the Montgomery County Probate Court. And uh, you can see here, you can see the names right there and the numbers next to them. And one thing I learned, and this is where, again, these records can be very hard, is that if, you're, if you are trying to skim the records to find the enslaved persons, look for the, the proper names and the big numbers. Um, and, that's, that's, and in this case, uh, there, there's two people sometimes per line. That's not always true. Sometimes everyone gets their own line, uh, things like that, but you can see how they mention uh, there's Phoebe and two children, so they would mention the women and children together, 
Sometimes they include the names of the children, sometimes they do not. All right, so when you are reading an estate inventory, a uh, property I've found, again, this is experience with the Natchez records, was most often listed in the following order. Real estate, whether it was land or structures, enslaved persons, livestock, and then personal possessions, such as firearms, clothing, and household goods. And in some instances, individual enslaved persons do appear out of order in the inventory. It's like you might have you know, six or 10 in the front, and then you, I, would, I would sort of keep reading just out of curiosity, and then I would find you know, two more at the end. And I'm like, why are these people at the back? So you do have to read the whole thing. Um, so information in the inventories varies, uh, usually includes the name and the age of the enslaved person. Uh, sometimes you only get a name and not an age. Um, some inventories include other details, such as the physical description, references to special skills, if they were a blacksmith or a tanner, if they had medical conditions. Uh, sometimes there's family information, a daughter of, son of, or as you saw in the previous slide, Phoebe and her two children, so they might include parents and children. Okay, so this is another example of an estate inventory. This is actually one that is from 1818, and you can see at the top there, it said Mississippi Territory, and they crossed it out and wrote State of Mississippi because they were a state. Uh, this one is actually um, kind of helpful because it's typed. Uh, you will notice that they, they do still have the long S, so there might be some places where Mississippi it still looks like Mississippi. Um, but you can see over here, they start with the house, and then this, in this one, actually, of course, I picked one that proved me to what I said totally wrong. Uh, the enslaved person is down at the bottom. But you can see, this is, this is frequently what they look like, uh, just so you can get an idea. This one is not on the site yet, because we have just, we've just finished transcribing it. Um, okay. So estate administration records, these uh, document the activities of the executor, including bills paid on behalf of the estate and other financial transactions. So these records often include activities related to enslaved persons, such as doctor visits, clothing and shoe purchases, and food purchases. And estates could be, and often were, kept open for years after the property owner died. So estate administration records can be voluminous. There can be tons of information. And what we scanned for this project was the material related specifically to enslaved persons. So there may be more records, this is particularly true in the Natchez files, there may be more records relating to land or other property that did not get scanned but is still there. So it depends on your, on your focus. Okay, so moving beyond the probate court, uh, other court records uh, include uh, things, for, uh, this, for example, is from Lowndes County, with people who, who registered enslaved people that they brought into Mississippi, and they were stating that they did not bring them here for the purpose of sale or hire. These were enslaved persons who were working you know, at their home or on their farm. Um, and there's actually two books of these. We only have one up right now, but the other one will, should be up pretty soon, we're hoping. And then other, still more court records, they also appear in records of civil and criminal cases. Uh, in civil cases, enslaved persons were most often involved in cases where personal property or debt were at issue. And in criminal cases, enslaved persons were sometimes involved in property crimes as well as in violent crimes such as assault or murder. And then in plantation, moving totally beyond the court, um, we are also looking at records that could have been used as evidence. Right? If you could pull something in to show that a person was enslaved, we said, all right, we're gonna scan that. Uh, so plantation records, records that document the operations of a plantation, including journals, receipts, and bills of sale. These are often found as, as part of personal and family papers. Sometimes they often do show up as kind of organizational records if, if it's just records of the plantation. But most often they're in part of personal or family papers. So this one is from the University of Mississippi. This is just a page from a ledger. Uh, it says at the top, by payment through the hands of William Snodgrass in full, $16. Um, and it, it, they may, this may have been 
documenting a hiring out record just because they have multiple entries there, but it's from, Jan it's, at least starts in January of 1818. Okay, so the receipts and bills of sale, these documents can be found in probate files as well as in personal and family collections, and they document the transfer of an enslaved person from one enslaver to another. These can include the names of the buyer and the seller, the name and the age of the enslaved person, the date and location of the sale, and may also include a physical description or, or other family information. There's a lot of might and may in here because they didn't always include this information. Some of them were really detailed and some of them were really not. Um, these also can include the home locations of the buyer and the seller, which you can then kind of trace people's movements. Uh, there's one that's it's not it's on the site, but it's not in here, where it was for a young lady named Priscilla who started in Kentucky and was, uh, was sold in Natchez. And so you can see that. I don't know for sure if they walked her down the trace, but they certainly might have. So this is an example of a bill of sale. Uh, this is so it's saying received a William A. Burnside, $360 in full for uh, a young man named Gabriel. And, uh, and then they sort of, they state that he is uh, sound in body and, and it's also a slave for life. So this is from a, a collection, from a collection of family papers at Mississippi State. And as you can see, someone at some point tried to tape this and that, that did not go well. So um, here's a shout out from archivists everywhere. Do not tape things. Uh, at least not with scotch tape. All right, so this is the actual project itself. And I'm going to show you this, and then I'm going to attempt to switch to a live look, and we'll see how that goes. Um, so this is, this is our project website. Uh, you can click on Search and Browse Available Records, which will take you to this page, and then you can do a keyword search. Uh, up on the left there, or you can click on individual collections if you're like, I only really want to see what's from here, what's here from Columbus. Uh, and then these, this is what your results will look like. And then you'll get something that looks like this. So when you get to this, do not click on the thumbnail. It looks very tempting, I know, but do not click on it. Click on instead the, the big title where it says appraisal and inventory. That's what you want to click on in order to get the, the document. So let's see if this is going to work. No. Here we go. OK. OK. So we're going to scroll down so you can see what this looks like. Um, let's, okay, let's go to Natchez. For, I'm just gonna show you what an estate administration record looks like. So this is the account of the administration of John Burney. Click on this, and then it's gonna give you a lovely PDF file. So we're gonna scroll down. Okay, so you can see this one's from 1800. And you can also see it's, it's kind of in shreds. Uh, some of these things, we really were reassembling them on the scanner. So if you went to Natchez to look at it and you open the file, you might not see the image, you might see a pile of paper. Um, uh, but you can see here uh, all the different lines and the dates that will show you the activities of the executor. Uh, and down here, they do mention an enslaved person named Jack. Uh, and that what, this, what this line is about is that the following personal property were sold at, public, uh, at a public venue. And they, the, the amounts are gone. The amounts do show up elsewhere in the file. So we were, we were able to reconstruct that information. All right, back up a little bit. And then, all right, let's go to circuit court records in Columbus. So there's a lot of information here uh, about the circuit court and the history of the circuit court and how all of that functioned, which is very, you know, which is great. Um, 
Now, if you just if you're if you're sort of interested in the the Law and Order 1842 part part of this, uh, you can you can put in different keywords to search. Um, let's go with murder. So, okay. So again, here's here's what the results look like. So there were. There were 18 cases where an enslaved person was involved in a murder trial one way or the other. So this one we have here, under transcription, it's, it's a summary transcription because these, these files are very big and there's a lot of sort of legal mumbo jumbo. Um, so we, what we did here was condense it down to sort of the summary and the relevant names. Right, and in this case, the enslaved person uh, are actually not named, but their role in this was that they were being offered as a bribe to somebody else for that party to commit murder. Let's back up and go down one. Okay, so here, this is where an enslaved person uh, was actually accused of murder, and he was accused of murdering one of his fellow enslaved persons. Uh, and they, they actually did uh, summon other enslaved persons to testify. And I believe this is the one where I looked, and they do have a list of the people who were impaneled as the jury who were not enslaved persons. They were local white landowners. I recognize one of the names as a landowner. So the uh, justice was, as we might expect, extremely uneven. Um, okay. So let's see here. I have a feeling my PowerPoint has disappeared. But um, anyhow, does anybody have any questions? I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sure. <laughs> I think I only had a few slides left. <laughs> but we can, if you have any questions, go ahead while we figure that out. Oh, oh okay. Sorry, that's okay. No, that's fine. All right, we're just going to... We're going to go very quickly. All right, so future developments. Um, the one thing that I did not touch on during all of this was that part of what we were doing here was extracting data, right? We're extracting the names from these records. And that's what the, Excel, the real purpose of the Excel file was for that extracted data. And that extracted data will also be part of this site uh, that is also in the sort of uh, future attractions. Um, but we also will be contributing that data to, uh, to both enslaved.org and the Digital Library of American Slavery. So you will be able to, uh, to access that data. And also, if you just want it just to see it, we'll also, I'm happy to send it to you. We're not keeping it a secret. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, so if you have if you're interested in more information about specific items, uh, you want to contact the organization that contributed them to the project. So when you look at a digital record for a specific thing, you want to read that metadata, the information about the information, carefully and see which institution contributed and digitized a particular record because that institution and archivist is going to be the person who will best be able to answer your question. Um, and if you have more, if you have questions about the Lantern Project itself, then you can feel free to contact me. If you would like a session like this for your institution or organization, genealogy group, and so on, uh, I will be talking about this till I am blue in the face for most of this semester, so also feel free uh, to, to ask for that. Um, that's the end. Okay. Now. <laughs> now, uh, questions. If you'll raise your hand, I'll bring the mic to you. Yep.
I was outside at the sandwich table, so you may have covered this already. Okay. <laughs> but I would like to know um, how uh, capable of expansion is the project in terms of the scope, and are you seeking more partnerships with archival uh, groups? Uh, I would say it's very expandable. It was meant to be expandable. Uh, you know, we had, like I said, we had done the sort of very minimal technological expectations specifically because we wanted people who do not have, you know, like Mississippi State has its has libraries, has its own IT department. I know not everybody has that, right? And some places it's just gonna be volunteers and one computer. Um, so it is, it is meant to be expandable. Uh, I'm actually not going to get too deep into future partnerships other than to say we are open to the idea. I think, I think it would be fair to say right now we're just trying to hit the finish line. <laughs> and once we have hit the finish line, then we can talk about the next thing. But um, I know that uh, the Montgomery County Archives has already started sort of a, a secondary project based on this with another group in Alabama. Uh, so that, and that, that's what we want, right? We want that to happen. Um, so we are hoping that this would be the baseline for more people to do work like this and any advice or support that I could give I'm happy to do, but I don't want to promise anything until we get through what we need to do. Does that make sense? Okay. To uh, piggyback off the last comment, when you next, to the next phase, will there be an attempt to reach out to Jackson State, Alcorn, Valley, or uh, Tougaloo with this endeavor with the land project? I have, I'm doing that now. Uh, I were actually uh, have reached out to almost all of those places about doing um, information sessions to to spread the word, uh, and we were we definitely want to reach out to the HBCUs uh, to to partner in whatever way might be appropriate. Um, but we. Uh, definitely, we, I am right as we speak, uh, trying to, uh, to, schedule, to schedule those presentations and to make those connections. Yes. Um, I, I see a lot of similarities between this project and the Civil War Reconstruction Governors Project. Was there any thought to opening up this transcription work to volunteers who, you know, go through the process of, of doing it and having it approved by someone at your organization um, just to lighten some of those loads? We, I, will, I will be honest, we did not think about that. I'm not opposed to it, right? Like, the more help we can get, the better. Um, but we had... We, what we had also been doing was trying to create opportunities for graduate students uh, on whether it's the Mississippi State campus, uh, Columbus was, has been able to provide, you know, create opportunities for students at the W. Um, I think the same, the same was true at the University of Mississippi. Uh, but again, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to it. All the help, we need all the help we can get, definitely. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to know, have you personally, or anybody that's working on the project personally, uh, recognize any names of their family, family members or recognize anyone that they know? Uh, or well, family members that they might have known? I, if you may not, have, may not have noticed, I'm not from here. Uh, <laughs> so no, I did, not, I did not recognize any of my, my family members in these records. Um, there, I think there might be one person who did recognize a family member in there, uh, which is, even though I'm not from here, does not mean that my ancestors did not contribute. Uh, they were uh, factory, the factory workers in Lowell, Massachusetts. So they made the Lowell cloth that, uh, that the enslaved persons wore. So, um, but I have not, in these records, I have not recognized any family members, no. 
We have a comment and question from the live stream. Uh, Dear Payne says, thank you, Jennifer, for helping to make this information accessible to the public. This is important work to accurately and thoroughly understand the history of chattel slavery, specifically in Mississippi. It may be difficult for some to digest or accept, but it is necessary. Then she goes on to ask, the Bettersworth History textbook used in the 60s and 70s showed that Negroes were prone to criminality. Are these records useful to determine how many enslaved persons were victims of crime versus perpetrators, or was crime against an enslaved person not recorded? I mean, there's at least one case where, and that I just had just shared, where the enslaved person was murdered, and it definitely made it into the criminal justice system. Um, this sample might be too small to really answer that question, but I think that, that would certainly be. Uh, a, a, an interesting avenue of, of research. Um, dependent, you know, I'm trying to think, uh, because Columbus was where we had the criminal court cases. Uh, Mississippi State has some court records that are circuit court, but I think they were mainly civil. Um, so I, I, think, I think my answer to that would be I think that, again, this, this sample size may be too small to really make a, a definitive conclusion on that, but that that kind of question is definitely something that you could at least start with this. You might need to get beyond this, but you could certainly start here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what, if any, extrapolations have you all been able to make about the socioeconomics of the various enslavers, uh, i.e., uh, how broad-based was this in rural communities? Uh, was it just a rich man's game, or who all was guilty in this? Uh, this is mainly what we observe from the Natchez records, is that, no, it was not a rich man's game. That there were, there were enslavers who were wealthy and had a lot of property, and there were enslavers who were not, and did not have a lot of property. Um, and I think that's probably the best summation of that. There, yeah. I was just gonna ask, um, in terms of tri transcribing, I heard you say earlier that it's kind of hard to read some of the Victorian area handwriting. Do you have any resources, and I guess I could ask Laura this, I don't realize she's sitting here, but resources in terms of learning how to better read that information? And then my second question was gonna be, you mentioned that your family's from Lowell, Massachusetts. You have any relation to Spoons Butler? And then I thought about the fact that his son-in-law was a Deborah Ames, who was the governor of Mississippi. Oh, no, I mean, my, <laughs> my family were famine refugees. Uh, they, you know, <laughs> they, most of them were dead before 1900 uh, because they, they, got, they had some sort of lung complaint. My grandfather was the fifth child and only survivor, so um, no, no, they, they did not have any, you know, fancy connections like that. Uh, now, as for transcription, what I actually, what we do have at Mississippi State and what I did share with graduate, student, graduate students who've been working on this is a penmanship book. Uh, from about 1890, which is a little bit late for our purposes. But we did find that if they could see what it was supposed to look like, right, or if they could practice, you know, kind of writing in the same way, sometimes that did make it easier. Um, also, just repeated exposure to it. So I know the, 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 also the other thing is that I learned to write in cursive when I was about seven, right, because I'm an old. Um, and that, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and a lot of the students who are coming in and even young archivists did not learn how to do this. So for them, it's almost like a foreign language. And you're, and you're kind of handing them this, this thing that's 200 years old and saying, what do you mean you can't read this? Uh, and, and they're like, why would I be able to read this? Um, so if you, if, you, if you sit down with it or, you know, pick one and you just have to sort of struggle with it. Um, you might want to start, actually, some of the, the circuit court records because they were written by uh, 
pretty much entirely educated men, their handwriting is actually really nice. So if you start with the decent handwriting and, and, and develop a sort of familiarity with what, again, what the letters are supposed to look like, uh, that can make it easier when you're then branching out to the real scribble. Um, the other thing is, is that transcription can frequently be a group project. Uh, and, you know, I have a lot of years of experience with Scribble at this point, and even I will still, you know, do a, do a little phone a friend <laughs> and, and call, call a colleague over and be like, what word is that supposed to be? Um, and, and so if you can take one of these, you know, print out the PDF and sit down and just try, you know, just one line at a time, and sometimes you'll be able to work it out from context, right? And sometimes it's just like, huh? And there was, there was one, uh, so I was working on, I was sort of going back over a transcription a student had done. And sometimes I can tell what the word is based on the point that they're like, what? Um, and there's something that it was like, a, it was like number and then a word that I thought m might be acres. And then I went and looked at the document and it, it really, it wasn't acres, it was arples. I'm like, the heck is an arple? And so I went to, I asked Mr. Google what, what arple was, and it turned out to be a um, type of measurement. It was French. And I thought, aha, our colonial past comes back to bite us. Um, so you have, to, you have to kind of be patient that there are going to be things that may not seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, and, you know, sometimes if, you, if you're like something, something, I have no idea. And then just like skip over it, just kind of just keep reading. And it may make more sense once you, once you get a couple, lo couple of lines down. Is that helpful at all? <laughs> And ram okay. I think you should name names. Who are some of the who are some of the wizards in the state at deciphering cursive writing? Well, I will, I will say my archival colleagues uh, are all very good at it. Um, so, yeah. Yes, I'm still trying to understand the scope of the project. Are these partner institutions transcribing records they already have, or are they going out looking for records? We are. There, there's there's almost what, 90 to 100 courthouses in the state of Mississippi that right. have all this stuff in them. Right. We are transcribing records we already have. That's what I thought. So, uh, it's, so it's very, very limited scope. Yes. Um, and we should also, I should also note here that uh, because this is time and labor intensive, particularly with the probate records, we have not necessar necessarily scanned all of the records held by a given institution. We scanned as much as we could with the time and money that we had. So we are also hoping, uh, you know, in terms of future projects, that this will act as leverage and as benchmarking for future projects, because I can tell you exactly how many folders uh, of probate records we can scan in a week if we go to Natchez and sit down and do nothing but scan. And, and to be able to say, this is how many, how many records uh, two people and two scanners can get through, and to you know to try and and because when you're when you're trying to forecast a cost on something, that's what you need to know is how long is this going to take, um, and the 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 probate records of of Natchez and of Adams County are vast, and this could take a lifetime. Uh, and we, this is a very, very tiny sampling, but, uh, but we thought it would be better than nothing. Yes. Yes. Uh, we've been watching Henry Louis Gates's show, Finding His, Your Roots, and quite often he has on black persons who are trying to trace themselves back to the, what happened what happened in slavery and find the generations back then. Has he made any contact with you about finding Mississippi? Uh... He has not. He has not.
It would, the courthouses are meant to have and preserve records. I'm interested in the kind of sources that you and your partner institutions went to to get things like plantation records, which would seem to be probably the most direct record of the enslaved people. And I'm wondering, is there any systematic effort, either in Mississippi or elsewhere, to try and recover and compile these records, either from plantations? I mean, there was this massive refinancing of everything after, during, re, during and after Reconstruction, after the war. Do we have any notion where those records might be and how they can be assembled? Uh, the plantation records are drawn from manuscript collections at universities. So I can speak for Mississippi State, uh, when, or the, the manuscript division at least, not the entire university, I should specify, uh, that um, we are very grateful to the families who have donated these records to us. Uh, part of the inspiration for this project was a donor who had traveled to Virginia and been in the reading room doing her own genealogy research and been sitting near an African-American family who were struggling with theirs. And she thought, you know what I have sitting at home? And so she, um, she contributed them, she donated them. So uh, <laughs> this is also where I say to the people who can hear me out there on the internet, if you have these records in your house and you are willing to turn loose of them, uh, you know, we are, Mississippi State is very grateful to receive them. Um, and, and so our, is, collecting plantation records is part of what we do. And so when people come to us and they want to donate these records, uh, we are interested and we do want to have that conversation. How much have you interacted with or do you know of the work that enslaved.org is doing and the other uh, entity that you talked about that's the, collecting the data, just sort of the, the names and... and the Digital Library of American Slavery? Yes. We have, well, I have talked with them a little bit uh, about that process and about uh, contributing our materials, but I have not gotten deeply involved in that. And so are they basically scraping for names, locations, uh, or so what, I, again, I came in late, but what's in the Excel file? The, the Excel file is where we have uh, as much information as we can get out of the record about the enslaved person. So, name, description, age, location. Uh, if, if, it's a, if it's a record of a transfer of some kind, the name of the, well, let's say it's a, it's a sales record, the name of the buyer, the name of the seller, uh, or if it's, a, you know, if it's a transfer in a will, uh, the name of the, the deceased person, and then the name of the family member who the enslaved person was transferred to, um, and that's what is going, and it, like if they have, if there's any information about, like if it says, you know, daughter of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, um, if there's any information about their, like if they knew a trade or something, like if they were, you know, a brick seller or something like that, or, or a brick maker, um, all of that we would try and get into those records. And that's what's going to go to enslaved org, and also hopefully someday be on our website so you can just see you could also search in that database and not have to wade through all of this other questions if not remember to come this weekend for the green book documentary screening uh, on sunday tomorrow evening isabel wilkerson at Galloway, be a fantastic program, and then come back next week when Douglas Richardson will talk about a, a, an overlooked and forgotten story uh, in Hines County, Jackson, and Clinton. But now, 
Help me thank Jennifer McGillan for this fabulous program today.